Kia ora koutou, no mai haere mai ki tēne kaupapa. Hello and welcome to this Tapu Te Aki Manataonga webinar from the Association of Educators Beyond the Classroom called Helen Lloyd Tukawingwa. I'm one of the learning specialists for the team. This webinar is number 27 in our series and it's about bicultural museum practice with the wonderful Puawai Kians. I'll introduce Puawai in just a moment, but just as usual, we'll begin with the karakia. And please note that we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on our YouTube channel and our website for those who can't come to the live event. And if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we'll come to those at the end of the presentation. Here, karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā taratara ki tau, e hi aki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei mauri ora. Well, it gives me absolute pleasure um, to introduce the wonderful Pua Wai today. I'm so thrilled that Pua Wai has some time to share with us today. She's got so much amazing um, knowledge, skills and experience. I'm really looking forward to her presentation. Um, she leads the audience and insight directorate here at Te Papa. So she's officially my big boss and I love having her as my big boss. <laughs> She has a really broad experience in the museum sector, and I'm sure most of you will know her work. Um, she's worked in concept development, exhibition development, curation, and also worked with communities. Her strength in supporting bicultural and Māori practices is particularly pertinent now for us at Te Papa, while it's reaffirming its commitment to manatanga. I'm personally in awe of Pua Wai. I feel that she is a wahine tua, a strong vocal advocate in our sector and a really inspiring leader. So I'm trying not to gush too much Pua Wai, but I'm really thrilled to have you here today. Um, so yeah, welcome. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, um, my name is Pua Wai Cairns. Uh, thank you very much for that very lovely intro. Uh, blushing away. <laughs> um, I'm very honoured to be here and also to be in front of so many of my colleagues from across the museum sector who are looking after the mines. Um, the Hinengaro, um, Nga Puna Matauranga um, within, our, um, within our museums and within our archives, within our galleries and within our centres for storytelling. So kia ora koutou. Um, should I just kick off? Yeah. All right. So um, feel free to ask any questions you want. Uh, the crew are going to be keeping an eye on the chat for me just to make sure that I clock any questions. I'm also massively accessible across about three bajillion channels. So if there's anything that you want to reach out in particular about, um, feel free to contact me over right? on like LinkedIn and on Twitter and then Facebook and then um, the email. And you, I am happy to talk to anybody who wants to pick up some cordial at, a, um, at another point. I'll also keep an eye on the future loon discussion on the chat boards just in case something else comes up. And you'd like me to um, address specifically? Kapai kai do. Okay, kapai. All right, we'll go. We'll kick off. Let's just make sure that my practice trying to share my screen earlier has paid off. <clears throat> All right, 
You yeah. just need some, oh, yeah. All right. presentation mode. Yep. Sweet. Okay. Just hide that bit. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. All right. Kicking off. So, tēnā koutou. Um, so, uh, the, the team have let me know that uh, a couple of my articles have been shared, uh, or a couple of my blogs have been shared on um, as part of your course um, literature. Um, the the things that have been in some of the stuff that I put into those articles or into those blogs basically underpin what I'm about to share with you. This was originally um, developed for a keynote that I gave in um, to a big group in Amsterdam, but I thought it was really pertinent um, to bring it in front of you as um, a, a group of kind of culture change makers. Um, and my hope is that maybe just sharing some of the things that I've been trying to do in order to reorient some of the old currents that I work with, <clears throat> maybe of some kind of use in your um, specific context. I know that it, sometimes it feels a bit apples and oranges and a lot of my background is as a curator, but um, I think there is some things that are quite general and can be shared across across our different professional realms. So I've called this, I don't belong here, Indigenous Practices and Museums. And that particular title came out of a great sense of kind of loneliness and isolation that I felt, um, especially when I moved into the head of the Māori collection or head of Mātauranga Māori a couple of years ago. Um, I was I have, was put in place as a practice lead, uh, curatorial practice, also to look after um, our physical collection. Um, so leading the acquisition, um, the interpretation, and the scholarship derived from the collection, but also trying to grapple with ma what Mātauranga Māori meant within a museum context um, and what that meant to me personally um, and the, the, the overwhelming sensation I had when I realised that I now had a, a title, a scary title called Head of Mātauranga Māori. Hence the big freak out, I don't belong here. It was also my chance to actually put some uh, put a Tom York picture in one of my PowerPoints. So, if you're um, if you are a 1990s person, if you're a Britpop fan, then hopefully this is like a, yeah, this is the presentation for me. Kapoi. So um, a lot of the time when I'm thinking about trying to make change, <clears throat> it is definitely about gazing into the future. When I was a curator, um, especially doing collecting, a lot of my background, um, the kind of specialization I had as a curator was in contemporary culture, uh, contemporary Māori culture. And one of the things that, that was kind of difficult about that particular portfolio was that a lot of the time when you're acquiring contemporary culture, they are objects that are not yet proven to be of value. They're not objects that are proven to be of any importance. Um, they tend to potentially feel ephemeral, um, popular culture, um, populist, uh, temporary. And so the argument to bring something like that into a museum, um, you have to try and project into the future about what this importance could eventually be. Um, the image I used to originally use as a curator was I would always imagine a, a, a Māori woman curator 100 years in the future and that I was trying to prepare a collection that she would use. So I would kind of go through quite an elaborate imagining of what she would want. <clears throat> and I would imagine that she had been given an exhibition uh, project to create um, a history show about Māori life in 2012, uh, given that this was 100 years in the future. What could I do to make sure that she would get all the things she needed to tell the story that I hoped she would. And the reason I kind of would speculate on that is because when I would sit in the collection myself, trying to draw together a story of my people in the 21st century, the things that I was relying on were normally collected from the New Zealand Wars period. They were um, the stories of very significant, um, the, the first politician, the first this, the first that, people who came from noble families, people who are of historical importance. So how could I pull together the story that I wanted? And I wanted to make sure that I did not do the same thing for this curator in the future. There was a much more sophisticated title for this approach. And so when, um, 
the, the first, the kind of inaugural head of Mātauranga Māori was appointed, his name was Wayne Ngata, Dr. Wayne Ngata, and he had coined a title, a term called the Mukapuna Clause. The Mukapuna Clause is an assurance that whatever we do now, we should be planning that the outcomes are going to be felt and reaped in the time of our grandchildren. So it's about decentering our own selfish desires or our own desires to gratify and satisfy ourselves in the present and make sure that we are thinking uh, equitably about the future of our grandchildren and what they're going to need. And so there's a natural instinct to think and gaze into the future to understand the impact of our work. So again, going back to the roots of my practice, which was um, curatorial, um, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of um, information that you could pull up around the root word of cure um, to curate, which is to cure or to look after, to care for. So a lot of the questions, the first questions I started asking is, who is doing the caring, and who does the defining? Who defines what good care looks like? And so I pulled this image out. This is uh, I think from the 60s, published in the Dawn Post, and this is from the old old Buckle Street Museum. And I mean, it's it, it would have been fairly, it's a beautiful image, but it's also an image that demonstrates the um, unusual power dynamic that can exist within a museum. That mannequin, by the way, still exists. So if you come into our um, Te Ahuru Mōwai, which is one of our collection stores, he is still standing on a plinth in there. Um, and it's a really interesting sort of time capsule to look at how 20th century museums decided to show some of our um, taonga. But, um, this is where I was very preoccupied with, was looking at the legitimacy of who is doing the caring, who defines our stories. That uh, went down a further uh, kind of line of thought when I met up with Moana Jackson, and that was where the blog Museums of Dangerous Places came from. His assertion was that museums are dangerous places because they define the storytelling. And so in that is the question of who is they? Um, so going back to what I originally opened with, which is how do we change some of the different river currents within the museum in order to make spaces for ourselves to change the way that it tells the story? Um, picking up the challenge within Moana Jackson's words that museums are dangerous places because they control the storytelling. How then do we try and look at telling different stories? Now, like I said, this is a very curatorial um, kind of proposition, the way that I'm specifically framing it. But I know the idea of storytelling has just as much relevance within um, museum educating because it is about the person who's narrating the story to those who want to learn. It's about the authority and the accuracy and the authenticity of that story. So I started um, working on a project. It manifested, it kind of landed in 2017, but it's got roots way back about 10 years earlier to, um, earlier than that. So when I was working at Creative New Zealand, um, that was a job I had before Te Papa, the institution I worked at before Te Pups. Um, I traveled over to American Samoa, to Pango Pango, as part of the New Zealand contingent, um, this around about 2007. Um, as part of the Pacific Festival of Arts. It was over there that I met James Webster, who is a Taonga Pōro maker, he's a Taonga artist, he's an astronomer, he's a storyteller, he's a composer, um, and he's also a man that makes a, a, a type of Taonga called karetao. So when I sat on the beach in Pangopango, well, when I met him in Pangopango, I was incredibly taken by some of the tanga that he was working with, which are called karetao. In English, uh, probably the closest the closest kind of translation of that would be like um, articulated puppets. Um, but they're a little bit freakier than just puppets. Um, the, the, the only thing I can think of is that they're kind of like Chucky, where they are a toy, but they can also do really weird stuff depending on who's handling it or in, in the context in which they are. So. A lot of these, um, a lot of the taonga are used to tell stories, but in Te Māori, stories have power. Stories have power that you don't really want to be mucking around with if you don't know what you're doing. Karetao are kind of like one of those things. They're a type of a, they're, they're a way to divine or get communication um, from a space that we can't see. <clears throat> so we've got a lot of karetao in our museum, uh, maybe around about 
maybe 20 or so here in Te Papa, and you've probably got some of the karetao across your collections as well. They're beautiful, beautiful things. But what James had created was a hybrid form between the karetao and the tonga puro. So what we've got here are three of them. Two of them I, end up, I ended up acquiring. So this one here, if you can see my cursor, the putatara. This is called tangaroa. And over here, this little one here, with the, with the Pounamu Puku, this Tawhiri Mātia. And in the middle, while um, we didn't acquire this, this is a very close approximation to uh, Karetao Pūro that I ended up um, commissioning from James. So I first started working with him. I knew he had about seven Karetao, but um, I asked him, rather than removing those from him, I, get, I asked, could I, could I get you to imagine if all of your Karetao disappeared in the world, and there was only one karetao left, and that was in Te Papa, what would it look like? How would you make it? And so I commissioned that piece from him. And so he created um, uh, this piece, which is kind of modeled on the Putorino. Um, once we had gone through that particular project, so that ended up starting around about 2016. So this is nine years after we first met. Um, and then I started an acquisition project to acquire the other two. <coughs> So that was really, that was where I think I did a bit of a practice change. So you'll be all familiar with acquisitions that when we acquire taonga or acquire objects into a museum collection, we effectively um, take ownership of it, take possession of it, and take responsibility for preserving and conserving it to, with the intent to extend its life as much as we can in order for as many people as possible to learn from it, uh, to see it to benefit from the interpretation of it. The only thing with this kind of approach, with this idea of conserving and preserving uh, through, uh, after acquisition, is that you, you effectively interrupt or you pause the cultural life of that object. You stop the cultural life of it. It's functional life. There was one of the reluctant things about taking two or even three of James's karetao, especially because they were so unique in the world, that um, I could not bear the thought of um, interrupting their lives. The other thing which I had to be really conscious of is that they were of such massive importance to James and to his wife who performs with him, uh, Hinemwa, uh, who you can see in the image there. They were almost like their children. So to acquire them was almost um, asking them to give up something that was too deeply precious. So what we did is that we created an acquisition proposal and a collection proposal where we would collect the taonga, but um, rights would be given back to the family forever, that they would be able to come in and take the taonga back to continue to perform with them and continue to use them. And they've done that. I think they've come in and taken about four times. And then when Hinemua and James are no longer in the world, that then passes to their children. It would also, we were also, we also built into that agreement that um, if Tangapuro experts wanted to perform with them, then they were able to, if they were able to get permission for the, by the family. So this isn't anything new. This was, this is something I actually learned from um, an amazing curator that I believe trains me, helped train me up when I first became a curator, and that's Afina Tamarapa, who is now a teacher up at Victoria University. Um, and she was also trained up by um, some of the early practices within Te Papa, which is trying to dislodge or trying to challenge the idea of permanent acquisition by a museum to the point that it slips out of context and out of time with its original owners or with the culture that made it. So <clears throat> that was one thing that we did in order to change the current, as I've discussed. The other thing which I wanted to do is that I'm also conscious working with Taonga as they begin to slip out of use within the communities, people begin to lose the memory of how they were used. So I also commissioned a performance from James and Hinemwa, and um, they created and developed a unique um, show, showcase and brought in a whole bunch of different portal experts from around the country. Uh, we paid, we commissioned it to exist, we paid for the artist, we paid for the travel, we staged it here in Te Papa, we filmed everything. And so the idea is that in a hundred years time, if you remember their curator, she will also have 
the original makers performing with the tanga in a performance context so that she will understand the actual modi of the tanga how they used how they were how they were originally kind of um uh companions to the makers now even doing that even developing a proposal for the um, show was a bit of a tricky one um, I had actually wanted to do a bit of a white box recording. So I wanted to bring them into a studio so I could do lots of multi angles and white background and make it really clean and pure. And, and I was like, oh, you can zoom in on a tonga. <clears throat> but Wayne, who one of the best bosses I've ever had, challenged me and he said, when these tonga are in the hands of performers, and in particular when they are in front of an audience, it all changes. The way that they work, the way that they move, the way that the tanga are used changes in front of people. So he thought and he argued with me, no, you, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to record it in front of an audience because that's the way that they, that's what they were created for. So the curator in me, who was very selfish, going, oh, but I'll get cleaner shots in a studio. Um, I had to relent. And I, yeah, right, you know, you got a, you, you, you got a point. So we ended up doing that, and we put it, we staged doing to Wikil Tidal Māori, and it was incredible. We did it over two or three nights, um, and then we have that recording, and that recording was then um, borrowed, I believe, by my good mate Paul Diamond over at AT, um, ATL um, when they did the Puro exhibition over there, I think last year or the year before. Well, COVID's maybe years will go away, but um, yeah, it was really beautiful. Okay, so that's just an idea of some of the things that I've done. Just one, one, one thing that I've done when I was collecting to try and change. Looking back on the Mukupuna clause and probably more closely reflecting on my role now as a director. So I have around about, I've got about seven teams that work to me um, who are all focused on primary audience channels or audience research. And um, under them are around about 45, 50 people. So I, I, I I'm about a medium-sized director within Te Papa, but I'm very conscious of looking after them. The big thing that I'm also really responsible for is the audience program, uh, which is like the big kind of, this is the big mirror that a museum holds up to itself to make sure it looks good, isn't it? The audience program. So there are some principles that I wanted to put in place. One, when I started looking after the directorate, looking after my direct reports, looking after their reports, but also the responsibility of looking after the audience program. And the big one was around trying to build towards equity. So, <clears throat> uh, Pam Streeter, the boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, also in, one of, in, in what I've shared with you was the notion of modification, which was Moana Jackson's preferred term to decolonization. Um, decolonization for me is a little bit of a um, double edged sword. It is about challenging a colonial system, and that is a necessary thing. But also, I feel like if it's the only way that Indigenous people are able to express themselves within these types of institutions, it feels like an ex that never leaves your house. It feels like you're always trapped within a domestic situation that you've been trying to leave for a long time, and that you'll no longer be able to be read as a person who has your own independence, or as my people call it, your own mana musuhake, your own tino ranga tiratanga. So I've always struggled with the idea of decolonization being that one political expression of our people within, a, within an institution. And then when we had the meeting with Moana, who I've known for many, many years since I was a child, he expressed his same kind of dissatisfaction and he said that a lot of people are moving towards indigenization, but even then he didn't like that term. He called it remodification. Um, and this was bringing our culture back to be the culture, the currency of how we moved and how we thought and how we acted. So the idea of remodification is really important to me. And when I was thinking around the audience program and even around managing the directorate, I wanted to think of a generative system. I wanted to look back at my at, at what my kind of uh, ancestors were, would would um, hand down to us around how to live within a system that needs to give, but also needs to be given to. And that effectively sums up the system that is the audience program. In order to present content, to present stories to the different audiences across all our different channels, it's a system that is dependent on feeding things into it. So I looked at the idea of the mata, 
And this is what you see in front of you now. So we start here with the kākanō. It's a circular system. We start with kākanō, the seeds. Then we look at ngā the type of the germination, and see what seeds are actually alive and which ones stay dormant. Then we go to te whakato, which is the planting, to try and seed them into the ground. Then we go, probably for gardeners, they'll go, oh, you've jumped a couple of stages, but we'll go straight to the harvest. And we talk about the harvest that we give and we want to we create that harvest because it's about feeding people it's their conscious kind of feeding of others and why do you do that you want them to you want to feed them to mobilize and to nurture the future and then after the harvest you think about how are you going to start um reinvigorating the ground you look at the composting the things that weren't used you don't waste them and then you begin to an anticipate the new growth how does that composting go back into um, understanding the cycle again? All these type of systems that um, eject energy need energy injected into them. And so I started to speculate, well, what are the things that would come into this system? It would need to be responsive to the environment. So you weren't going to be planting watermelon where there's lots of snow and lots of rain. So you need to understand the kind of context in which you're going to be planting. You need to understand and practice a type of sustainability because you know that you don't really want the system to only um, work for a couple of years. You need to have that sense of permanence. And the only way you can do that is by understanding a sustainable practice. And the other thing is that it, it, it needs and desires quality. Quality soil, quality work, quality knowledge, quality seeds, quality everything. So these are the things that I started landing on. And what does that look like when applied to the audience program? Um, remember, this is when I first started. So this is all very, very naive thinking about two years ago. Um, it's been stretched out and challenged a bit since then. But effectively, we've stayed with this. So I started thinking about the raw ideas. These are the ideas that come into the museum, either via curatorial, from communities, from commercial ventures, from politicians, from um, uh, opportunistic thing oh, like COVID, COVID kind of um, created lots of encounters and lots of opportunities for different kinds of stories. So just think about the rawness. This is the kind of things, these are the seeds. But then you have to understand which of those are going to germinate. And in Te Papa, we tend to germinate through collaboration. So one person takes their idea and goes to sit with the team and they begin to discuss what this idea could look like. How could this manifest? What channel could this go across? Um, is, this, is this a book? Is it an exhibition? Is this a teaching program? Is this, um, is this a website? And then you begin to shape, shape that idea for best resourcing in order to start planting it. You begin to start plotting it out, going, okay, if we think this is actually something, not all things in the raw ideas are going to make it through, but we think that these things are going to make it. So you begin to scout them out and resource shape them and scope them. Then you deliver. And again, there's absolutely no difference to why we deliver to people. It's the intent to feed, to mobilize, and to nurture the future. But rather than feeding their pukus, you're feeding, feeding their hiningaro. And it's also two-way. Two this is two-way. Just like feeding from a garden, sometimes you're not going to eat everything. So we want to understand what wasn't consumed, what wasn't taken up. And we begin to learn. So we evaluate. And we begin to apply that evaluation across multiple things. You're looking at project evaluation, learning evaluations. You're looking at um, uh, visitor evaluations. You're looking at all these different metrics in order to understand well, what does the next cycle look like. And just going back to the injection coming in, what comes back into the system? Again, sustainability, care with relationships and resourcing. We don't want to a lot of the big things are when we collaborate with communities, we have to treat them with so much care because we don't want people to have that one encounter to be so horrific that they never want to come and work with us again. So there's a there's a care, a consideration, an ethical approach um, to how we look after relationships and how we look after resourcing. Responsive to the environment. So just like my earlier thing about don't plant watermelons in the snow, you also want to make sure that there, there are things in the environment that you might actually want to respond to. And I keep thinking of COVID. COVID has actually been one of the great kind of storms and has shaped a lot of how our institutions have worked. And the reason it's done that is because we are trying to stay responsive to the environment. So it's not just papatuanuku environment. 
it's the political environment, it's your economical environment. And the other thing are research and values, which are the things that you're consistently injecting back into the system, either through research agents, um, through different people that work with Nte Papa or in, your, in, your, in all of our institutions, um, and through the, even the different values that people who work for us bring to the organization. So all in all, the biggest lesson for me is to try and understand what my purpose is. Um, it's really important for me to always kind of think of that intrinsic purpose because that is what determined that big diagram, like my purpose is, my, I want to make sure that I'm going to bring some Māori kind of thinking to my environment because I, this is what I'm comfortable in, this is my core. So this is a purpose statement that I developed a couple of years ago when I was with Mataranga Māori, and it probably hasn't changed that much actually, um, which was to create a sustainable environment for the team I manage and the teams who support us in order that Mataranga Māori, Māori knowledge and knowledge systems can flourish within the museological practice of our museum. That was what I determined to be my purpose. And I think it's really important for each of us, especially when you're working on your own, you're working in really lonely spots, is that you you actually consciously develop what your purpose statement is and hold it to your heart like you're like you're wearing a pounamu. Conversely, I also think it's important to do a process what I call understand the shape and outline of your tanifa. So I have fear drivers as well as purpose mission drivers. The fear drivers are the things that probably tend to compel me to act in ways that sometimes I'm not very proud about because I'm trying to avoid a fear. The fear in this case I call the tanifa. And when I say understand the shape and outline of your tanifa, sometimes if you look back and you run your hand across or around that tanifa, you realize it isn't as big and bad as you thought it was. So you begin to moderate the way that you're reacting to it. The best way for me is that I have to write down exactly what is making me fearful. What is the thing I fear the most? What's the failure that I fear? And so when I was looking at the audience program, this was effectively what I feared the most, that I was going to oversee a violent, wasteful, violent meaning that people weren't going to be treated well, a violent, wasteful process that burns out people, privileges the strong and dominant, and reduces representation to only certain groups. I wanted to take that fear statement to the different groups that I was working with so they understood the moves that I was making, and um, it would hopefully make me more transparent if they understood my purpose and they understood my fear. Um, and for me, it's probably more about myself so that I can have that sense of reflection. Um, so I am I can curtail some of the things that I might do to react to my fear. It just gives me a sense of control over it. So I think that's probably my last slide. It's This is a big smush of things that have been really important to me in my practice. It's a bit of a smush um, flyover of all of the different jobs that I've had in Papa, um, the different things that have helped me, I hope, be a better, um, a better kind of person within my museum. Um, and I think hopefully just to share some of the things that um, are important to me that have helped me, just in case it's of any kind of use to you. Uh, Woohoo! Thank you. Wow. That was amazing. Um, so I've been keeping an eye on the chat and I haven't noticed. I'll just scroll back now. I didn't notice any questions yet. So if you've got a question, please type it in there or a comment. Um, or if you wanted to um, take the mic, we've got time. You could raise your hand and we could take take your time. Um, I was writing furiously. Here were all my notes from um, Poor Wise session, and I really, really loved your um, Mara, your garden metaphor for understanding the audience um, engagement and development um, cycle of work. I thought that was really fantastic, and I think it had lots of relevances for. Um, for us in education as well. And I think we could take something like that model and apply it to our work, which is part of that bigger um, cycle. And you've got some really great questions for us to ponder, which I've been writing. It'd be lovely to hear people's responses to them if anybody's um, 
got some quick quick responses and wants to come up with them now. The Mokapuna clause, I think when we're thinking about um, teaching, we're often in the moment. You know, you talked about we're, we're instead of focusing on the now, we should be thinking mm -hmm. about the future. And I think as educators, we do focus on the now. We're engaging with students right in front of us, right here, right now. But what do we do about thinking about the future and um, the path that we're um, treading in terms of future generations of where that's going to lead us? So mm -hmm. I think that's a really good provocation for us to think about in terms of our work. Um, and I really love the um, two-way process in that mother diagram and it made me think of the concept of ako which we talk about quite a lot of the reciprocal learning and how we learn from learners as well as them learning from us and that sort of two-way cycle um i also really loved the what is my purpose and what is my failure question and i'm going to go away and think about that for myself and my practice and i think it would be you know it'd be lovely to hear people's thoughts on that if anybody has done that for themselves have you posed that question to yourself have you got an idea of what your answer might be to either of those i guess we um did talk in one of the courses online courses about coming up with a vision statement for education or a mission statement so it'd be good to hear if anybody's got anything about that and i really loved what you were talking about those terms decolonization indigenization and remodification mm. um i've got another one to throw in there and a question mm. for mm. you um so this has come up in some of our other um conversations and i just would love to hear your thoughts on the term biculturalism oh yeah um biculturalism is is a to me, it's a term that's come up out of the colonial encounter. So it's intrinsically kind of sutured into colonialism. Um, it's a type of negotiation between the two colonial um, groups, you know, and legal kind of circles a bit between the Crown and Māori. But a lot of the time it's between the two treaty partners. So in Te Papa, we, um, our treaty interpretation was between Tangata Whenua and Tangata Tiriti people who were here before the treaty and people who come here by the treaty. Um, so biculturalism is this assurance that those two parties are going to work together in a way that is respectful of the two desires of those parties. So it is effectively a constant, ever persistent negotiation. I don't think biculturalism is naturally a comfortable space to be in. Um, I think it's one of absolute negotiation. Sometimes I think you would call it a marriage, um, but yeah, it's a bit iffy because that also kind of creates a whole bunch of different kind of um, dynamics in there that just muddy everything up. But it is effectively, for me, a relationship between two parties who are trying to be who they want to be in their culture, but understand they occupy a common space. Um, my big my big kind of challenge for biculturalism is that it is not a natural state for both parties. Māori are not naturally bicultural. We have bicultural manifestations now. We we can move between languages. We can code um, code code shift, whatever they call it. Um, but it is not a natural feeling. It is something that you learn. It's one you acquire. For Ma for Māori, it's 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 acquisition to survive. It's acquisition to adapt. It's acquisition in order to respond to racism, to inequity. Um, and I think I can't speak for what biculturalism feels like on the Tamatariti Pākehā side. I hope that allies and accomplices on that side can talk truthfully about what biculturalism actually feels like on that end. But from my perception, sometimes it feels like um, my treaty partner believes that to be bicultural, they have to be just as Māori as I am. I don't believe that. I don't think that that's what biculturalism requires you to do. It doesn't, I don't really want people to try and be a better Māori than me. I'm struggling to be as good a Māori as I can already. I don't need that. But what I would like is understanding that my Māori manifestation and my Māori hopes and the things that I use to navigate my culture are going to be respected by my treaty partner. And space is going to be made for that manifestation, for the way I manifest. Um, uh, to um, to Daisy, what's her name? To Daisy. Oh my God, I'm just blanking. My, she's my mum's mate, and I've just forgot. Moxon. There we go. 
Lady Tudati Moxon. I was in a um, a lecture that she gave to like um, Asthma Foundation or something. It was amazing. And she started talking about being very dissatisfied with the principles of the treaty, um, the way that they you know all the peace. What she talked about, what she believed is more important for the future, is the principle of options. The principle of options offers Māori the um, opportunity to go through one door, which is the Māori door, which is actually incredibly complex and nuanced all on its own. But also, if they go through the Pākehā door, they're going to be respected in that way as well. She was speaking specifically about health provision and the type of health services that Māori get that you could go to a Māori provider and your needs would be catered to as Māori, but they would go to a Pākehā provider and your mana will be respected as Māori. And so that's what she called the principle of options, that Māori do not just have to navigate and walk down one path. Um, that isn't what the treaty offers. The treaty offers us the full rights of citizenship but it means that both of those doors, both of those pathways, have to understand how to work mm. with us. Mm. Wow. So biculturalism is a big deal. It's, it's a, it, it promises a lot. Um, and I think I wrote something about it for Museums of Aotearoa, which ended up going to spin off, which is, I think people underestimate what biculturalism actually requires from both parties. Mm. So I think that's why we all find it a bit dissatisfying sometimes. For Māori, it offers a lot. Um, and uh, we don't quite get the payoff that we want sometimes. Awesome, that was amazing, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna draw your attention, we've got lots of really wonderful, blown away by your kōrero, thank you, very inspiring and courageous. I won't say you your grounds for yeah, all your yeah. kōrero, you could run this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> the Canterbury Museum found your kōrero really interesting and they can see gaps in their collection. Um, yeah. Lisa from Gabbett Brewster, also interested in that acquisition yeah. work. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can. Um, Sabina in our in our um, loans and acquisitions team, she she was the one I worked with to develop the the contract with James, um, and a lot of the time it was just relying on what James and I had been agreeing to in emails. I was like, yeah, yeah, bro, you can have your tonga, absolutely, we'll do it, mm. and then. Poor Sabina having to actually retrofit that into the into the forms. Mm. So I'm deeply, deeply lucky that I've got so many kind of mission-centered people that work with me at Te Papa. You know, they don't try and resist, they try and find ways through. Very and the, the Manatanga principle you touched on um a point that obviously that under you know intersects with, underpins with, relates to yeah. what you're talking about there. Yeah, Manatanga, I don't know if you guys know the history of Manatanga, that was developed from a single, like a two-page memo that was generated out of Ngāpai Wawao, who were the Māori elders advisory group for um, the project office that eventually became Te Papa's project. And in there, a uh, memo was generated by um, Api Mahuika, um, in collaboration with Ngākai Wawao, and it was presented to the Mons Council, I think, at that point, um, asking for the enshrinement of a principle called Manataonga. Manataonga at that point was about, um, it was about making sure that the museum would recognise that sometimes there are competing interests, Māori interests in a taonga. So you could have a mere, and we do have a mere, that has two different ownership stories attached to it. Both of them conflict, but both of them can be traced through their kōrero. So a museum could potentially be put in an arbitration role where you can determine which narrative is the true one. Um, that's the power of the museum. What Manataonga principle did was, that it was to ensure that the museum would always respect that the complex stories around a taonga would be respected, whether it was the maker, the owner, the creator, or the maker, the owner, um, the iwi, the, the nature, the complex relationships that Māori have to taonga would always be looked after. But that is a really difficult principle to live by, <laughs> as you can imagine. So, um, but it is one that, that was the challenge that was put in front of us as an organisation. And because mana taonga has, not be, has become not just a way to um, interpret taonga, to research taonga, to, to, to be a collection manager. Um, it is now, it's actually become almost like a, a kamokamo vine 
where it's moved away from just being um, a Māori-centred philosophy, a Māori collection-centred philosophy. It's actually become a philosophy of practice across all of the collections within Te Papa. Um, so I'm not certain whether Api Mahuika and all of those kaumatua understood that that little kamokamo seed that they planted right back then has turned into this enormous vine that now kind of invisibly wraps Te Papa. Um, and that's that's what I think is one of the beauty, the beautiful things about bringing in really beautifully thought out for Karo Māori. Because I think th there's always some resistance to having for Karo Māori brought into an institution because there's a cynicism that the institution is just sort of wrapping itself with um, sort of window dressing of of, of Māoriness to make itself look like it's you know it's it's so on trend, but a lot. For me, Fukaro Māori within this museum has meant it's given me far more latitude to, to move according to my own intuition. Now, I am not a perfect Māori. I actually call myself a very bad Māori. I'm not very compliant. I, I question too much. I talk too much. Um, I am not very obedient either. So, um, and I am by no means the only one who thinks like me. So I think my culture and the way I work with my culture is not, I don't treat it like it's a, uh, like Moses' commandments that I have to follow them. They are principles that I can weave in and out of because that's my privilege. Um, so th this is my approach anyway. Like I said, I don't, I, I, the nervousness with that is that um, there, some people would think that I am just really naughty. <laughs> but... For me, it's about making sure that my culture is a living element within me and I push and pull around it, I search within it and the fact that I have it within the place that I work has probably meant why I've stayed here so long. Um, oh, kia ora Tanya. Um, I enjoy your work in biculturalism too, sister. I know you've written a whole PhD on this. So. <laughs> That's so awesome and I love Maria's um, comment um, about the living Māori of Taonga, I was that was something else I wanted to pick up on as well. Where you talk about um when you talked about that collection um with James Webster's work in taking the Taonga out of their um yeah. cultural life. Yeah. I think you use the term cultural life. I wonder if you could um just say something about that term Māori in terms of how it relates to my artifacts. Well, nei te mihi atu ki a koutou, koutou ma, um, o te tai tokero, tēnā koutou. Um, he uri a hau, um, hoki o uh, Ngāti Kuri, no te whānau Māori, um, so tēnā koutou. Um, yeah, there, there's, an, there's a really important um, pillar essay, if you haven't already read it, um, which is by Maina McKenzie, called Keeping Our Tāunga Warm. Maina McKenzie was the first Māori director of, of a museum within, within New Zealand. She managed the Manoa, um, and she wrote a lot. On, well, she didn't write a lot, but she what she did write was um, how amazing. And this one particular paper called Keeping Our Taonga Warm is what I consider to be one of the fundamental kind of canon essays for anybody who wants to understand museological practice within Aotearoa. The whole premise of that paper was that she was arguing for... Māori presence within New Zealand museums because the presence, especially of our elders, meant that our taonga would always be kept warm. The language would be around it, our tikanga would be around them, the, the, the physical presence, the physicality of our presence within museums was really important to what she called keeping the taonga warm. A lot of the inspiration for the kind of thinking does actually come out of te Māori, so um, Te Māori is again one of those kind of key parts in our history which determine the trajectory for museological practice within, um, within Aotearoa. And that was really notable because of the, of the editorial and authorita authoritative presence of Kaumatua within the selection, the interpretation of Taonga. Um, and that's what Te Māori kind of offered to us. It's interesting that because Te Māori was so popular overseas, it made New Zealand sit up and go, oh, hang about, 
maybe there is something to all these arts and crafts from all these people that used to live in Waibua and Gisborne, and now they're, oh, look here, there are now cities. Um, so I think I, it always makes me wonder, like, what would have happened if Te Māori was just like a, a big box office bomb? Would we have Te Papa? Would we have Māori curators? Because I'm pretty certain without Te Māori, I wouldn't exist, and my role would not exist, my place would not exist within Te Papa. With, I don't, te Papa wouldn't exist. It would be called the Museum of New Zealand. Um, so going back to that, to what you're saying, Ehoa, yes, I, I, I think it is really important to have Taonga beside their people. The people sing their songs. I think that's one of the things, like especially with our kaihautu, if, if, if Iwi wanted Taonga out of Te Papa to go back to their homes, now is the time to strike with the, with the kaihautu that we have. So um, yeah, let your Iwi know. <laughs> um, he is he is really um, supportive of you know the principle of of te Māori. You know, there was, there was the title of it, Te Hokinga, um, for it to return. So yeah, I think this is a very important time for us in terms of museum practice. Um, it's I think we're standing on a bit of a cusp of change. And I think we're way ahead of the curve. I don't know if you guys are watching what's happening over in Prague with ICOM, but they are just sitting in a room smelling their own farts as far as I'm concerned. It's not fresh enough. So the reason they're not fresh is because they keep just recycling old museum ideas and notions. So the thing to keep us fresh, I think, is to bring in, it's like that system model, to bring ideas from the outside. And I think that's what Aotearoa is actually really good at. Because I bet you a lot of you were not trained in museum practice. I bet you all came from backgrounds that are really from other kind of professions and you're applying those professional kind of practices to where you are now. That is what keeps our museum practice in Aotearoa fresh. That's my, my particular opinion anyway. I'm and glad you mentioned important. the ICOM um, little embattlement that you got involved in recently and calling them out I thought was really amazing I really loved <clears> that <throat> conversation that unfolded internationally and I think yeah it's really important to to do that sort of thing um and so I don't know if Mel, Mel's doing such a good job of putting references to the things that you're talking about into the chat thank you Mel and we'll be putting all of these links um alongside the recording of the webinar so people who've missed the live event will be able to watch the webinar and also read um and go back and revisit all of these links on things that you've mentioned there um one last question Mm. Oh my gosh, I've got so many questions. Does anybody else want to take the mic and ask a question? I feel like I've dominated the whole thing. Don't be shy. I'm really nice. <laughs> Don't believe the hype. I'm also very sensitive, so please be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Pardo might say something. She, um, oh, fine, no. no, that's okay. No, um, yeah, I guess... Oh, We've only got a few minutes left. This might open a big can of worms and take you a long time to answer. But I, we signaled mm. in our intro that um, Te Papa is sort of re-examining um, its position and how it articulates itself as um, a treaty-based organisation. Is mm. there anything you'd like to share with us about that? Yeah, I think it's a very new and raw thing to, to call ourselves a treaty partner. Um, I tend to sit on the executive as probably like the really um, the the unpleasant buzz fucking auntie, you know, or you know the sister of in uh, Pride and Prejudice, the one who was really bibly and preachy and didn't play the piano very well. You know, sit there just sort of muttering off really kind of just preachy yucky stuff. I kind of sometimes I worry that that's the role I take. But the one of the things I think I I I've said. I've challenged ourselves when we talk about treaty partner, is that to be a full treaty partner, that means Māori control ngā mea Māori. So that's what the treaty says. We will look after our treasures, we look after our stories, and we are able to be Māori. You can run your government, hey a koutou, you better make sure that we still get the full rights of citizenship, but we hold our mea. Um, we have our own tino rangatiratanga. If we look at what that means structurally within an organisation, that is a massive, fundamental, profound change. It, it isn't just the kaihautu and the CEO 
it effectively creates a cellular division of na mea Māori, na mea Triti. What does that look like? Um, so I, I just think there is some stuff to think through really, really carefully about the full whole implications of what the treaty um, actually says. It isn't a warm, fuzzy thing that makes that should make us feel like really happy that we're doing a good job. The treaty is a challenge. And the treaty, it's a weddle for us all. Um, and it's a promise to Māori that we will continue to be Māori. Not Māori caught in time, but Māori forever taking our culture into the future with all the benefits and privilege of their culture being able to change and evolve like all other cultures. So, um, yeah, I think there's there's some really amazing, fascinating opportunities that are in front of us if we stay true to what the challenge is. Um, yeah, and I, I think I see a lot of people go, we will we will be a good treaty partner. Te Papa's not just saying it. There seems to be some zeitgeist right now. And I think it's our role to actually say, what do you mean when you want to be a treaty partner? Because have you looked at it lately? It's pretty much still the same from 1840. Um, and what it what it promised the Te Reo vision, what it promised Māori, um, is the world mm. that our world will continue. Mm. Yeah, it will not stop. It's not. It's not just about the stuff that's held in time within a museum. It's that our culture would continue. So I have this whole thing about museums and not just places that hold objects. Museums are places for culture to continue, um, and that means Māori culture. Um, and we are contradictory. Like I said, I'm 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 not a good Māori. There are lots of good Māori and there are lots of bad Māori. There are Māori that will not agree on this. I think the moment all Māori are in agreement is that there's only one Māori left in the world. And that's awesome because that means our culture is still lively and nuanced and incredibly complex like all other people. So I, I just think there's just some caution but also a desire to drive to the full realization of what it means as promised under the treaty mm. yeah it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds yeah. um over the next wee while it's papa and yeah i think we're pretty much out of time now i feel like i could talk to you all afternoon thank you, you so afternoon. much yeah <laughs> thank you so much for your time today we have a very small koha that we give our speakers so don't get too excited it's only a little thing but thank you very much it's Amazing. a token of our yeah, appreciation for your time today um so before we um close and say goodbye we just need to let you know um a couple of things about what's coming up next and there we go so our next webinar is in two weeks time on Thursday the 8th of September, the same time, 3.30 to 4.30. And we'll be talking to our friends at the Wellington Zoo who are doing a really amazing job of teaching children about climate action. So they're going to be talking about their approach to that. So we hope you can join us for that. If you can't, as usual, we'll be um, recording it. The other thing is we're going to be hitting the road soon. So we are coming to you at last. Yay, COVID is not going to hold us back any longer. Fingers crossed, touch wood. Um, so these are the dates of where we're traveling to and where we're going. And we would love to see as many people as possible at these regional hui. Um, we know that you guys want to network and get to see each other um, face to face. And we've got a great lineup um, where we're going to look at New Zealand histories. We're going to be doing some sharing of practice. So it'll be a really good networking um, opportunity as well. So if you haven't already had an email invite to one of these from Mel, um, please let Mel know. Her email address is on there. Please get in touch with her and get yourself um, locked into one of those dates because we really would like to see the RSVPs coming in to know that we can. Uh, um, justify the cost of our flights and and order some catering to feed you all <laughs> so yeah we're looking forward to that please get in touch and please come along we're, like, we're looking forward to seeing you face to face um so i think yeah that's us would you like would you like to close us sure i i mean i thought so did not uh for come to know more tato more tato we know here and here 
kia wātea, kia māma, te ngākau, te tinana, te wairua i te aratakata. Koi a rā e rungo, whakairia ake kirunga, kia tīna, tīna, hui e, tāi ki e. Thank you. Kā kite.